Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. Uh, for many of you, who've been with UNA, UNA, uh, USA for a while, or, or maybe you're a model UN delegate. So, you, so the charter itself is something that has been present in your life for a long time. Then you'll know that the first line of the charter is, we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Well, those words, which have inspired a lot of people, I learned from reading Steve Schlesinger's book, were written by the one woman on the, the delegation to the UN Conference on International Organization in San Francisco. They were written by Virginia Gildersleeve, who was right there in, in the midst and making a case that the we the people side should be part of this organization made up the governments of the world. But I, I also learned the meaning of that statement, the meaning of the fact that the UN is about more than just its member states, it is a member state institution at its core, but it is about more than that by working with Gillian Sorensen, uh, by knowing the impact, the legacy that she's had over decades. So we couldn't have a better set of panelists to kind of take the temperature and elevate the moment of the UN's 70th anniversary. Steve Schlesinger is a fellow at the Century Foundation. He was a speechwriter for Mario Cuomo and when he was governor, you, many of you know Mario Cuomo well from his outsized political impact. Steve Schlesinger also wrote the book, which I have to say the entire UN Foundation leadership team has all read, uh, called Act of Creation. It's a, it came out in 2003, you can get it on Amazon, I would recommend getting it. Fantastic read on how this two month period of diplomacy brought forward the organization that we exist to support. So we have Steve to, to anchor for us how this organization came into being, what the, what the politics were that, that created the organization that we have. But then we have Gillian, who was commissioner for UN Affairs, International Affairs for the, the city of New York, went over, became an assistant secretary general for the UN system itself, and then became a senior fellow for the UN Foundation itself. And for our chapters, has really been the voice of the UN system, I would say for decades, has really made the case of personal connection uh, for, for individual Americans, for NGOs, uh, for in the United States, but far broader than that, uh, more so than any other figure, at least in the past generation. So we couldn't have two better panelists, and I would like to welcome them both to the stage. Exactly. Well, Chris, thank you for that kind in introduction, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, it's, it's quite an extraordinary thing to be honoring this organization on its 70th anniversary. I mean, it's really remarkable when you think about it. 70 years, the League of Nations only lasted 20 years, and most of these kind of global organizations don't last very often. They have very short shelf lives. So this is a really impressive moment in, in the history of, of the UN. Now, why, why has the UN survived for 70 years? I think that's a question a lot of people ponder from time to time. They don't quite f fully understand what the UN is always doing. They, they, there's certainly enough criticism of, of the organization, and yet it, here it is. Seven decades later, it's still in existence. And I think, really, if you look back at the history of this organization, it is due to the remarkable vision of a single leader who pushed for and fought for this organization, namely President Franklin Roosevelt. It was truly Roosevelt who, more than anybody else, kept alive a, the idea of a World Security Assembly for almost three decades until it finally happened, even as the League of Nations was faltering. Roosevelt was the first person, I'm sorry, the only person really at the end of the Second World War who continued to fight for this notion of a world security body. Of course, he had, as President of the United States, the financial resources to organize it, and he possessed himself the political mastery to shepherd it through. But he had, first of all, to convince his two closest allies that it was a worthwhile idea. I'm talking about uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, and of course the dictator of the of Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin. Ch 
Churchill was quite lukewarm about the UN, and Stalin was at least initially opposed to the whole idea, and it was really Roosevelt's very determined efforts that managed to sway both uh, of these leaders in favor of, of going through with the, with the idea of a UN. Now remember, in 1945, Roosevelt didn't have to do anything about an international security body. He could well have discarded the whole idea. After all, in 1945, the US was the most powerful country on the earth. We could have done anything we wanted. We could have acted unilaterally as we wished. We could have formed temporary alliances. We didn't need a permanent security organization. But he had a longer vision. He knew after the catastrophe of two world wars, in which in a 20 year span, almost 90 million people had died from the, from the catastrophes of those two conflicts, that our security could not be a matter of just Fortress USA. We needed allies, and our safety would be enhanced by a universal security body that could act collectively when war threatened. Roosevelt also knew that the time for creating this body was a very slim opening, very slim moment, because he had to pick a moment in which all parties would convene in a way to capture the sense that this had to be a collective group of, of, of states in order to make this body viable. Uh, he chose just as the Second World War was ending. Why was that an important moment? Because at that time, all the states, or at least those on the side fighting the Nazis, would still be clamoring for a shield against further conflict, and therefore would attend the conference. Had he tried earlier, I don't think it, there would have been a UN happening. And had he tried it later, just as the Cold War began, I can pretty much assure you there wouldn't have been any organization at all. Now, one of the things that he did that has kept this organization going for these seven decades is he had a quite extraordinary balance between realism and idealism about his approach to the to structure of, of the UN. He had learned the bitter lessons from the failure of the League of Nations, and he knew that the new organization could not replicate the League's weaknesses, though it must keep its best features. First of all, he placed no restrictions on the admissibility of nations into the UN, except that they, in 1945, had to be part of the anti-Nazi coalition. But they did not necessarily have to be democracies. They did not have to uphold human rights. All he was concerned about in 1945 was maintaining security, security, security around the globe. And to do that, all nations had to be involved. Second, he formulated language for the UN Charter that made the UN sound like and behave like a global police force, because that's what he wanted. That was what the whole point of the UN was. Indeed, if you look at the key passages in the Charter as regards military action, especially in Chapter 7, you will find that it proposes all sorts of armed actions, blockades, sanctions, air and sea assaults, a whole arsenal of military, militaristic tools defined, designed to defeat aggressors. Franklin Roosevelt did not shy away from the use of force at the UN. Third, he recognized that states, rather than elected representatives, had to form the basis of the organization if, if the UN was to be op to operate successfully. This is a recognition of the old 1648 Westphalia formula of the sovereignty of states, which still dominates the way the world works today. The UN thus is not a formal democracy. It's a collection of different nations, each with their own political structures. This is a recognition of reality. Fourth, he sanctioned two crucial organs within the UN itself, the Security Council and the General Assembly. Again, this reflects this balance between realism and idealism. The Security Council reflects his realistic sense of power realities around the world. It makes all the war and peace decisions at the UN. Its decisions are binding on all member states and only five nations are given the veto. This is in contrast to the League, where the League's edicts were not obligatory on its membership, and all states had the veto, which meant that a single rogue nation could stymie any action by the League. 
Then on Roosevelt's idealistic side, he supported the creation of the General Assembly, where all states, no matter how big or small, rich or poor, had equal votes and could advance their views openly about world problems. Still, its resolutions, though not binding, had moral force, and moral force which can't be discounted. GA, GA's resolutions often have an impact that go beyond the fact that they're not binding. Fifth, he made sure that the charter was a flexible document in its language, much like our American Constitution. Thus, it would be able to be responsive and adaptable to all sorts of crises that might, necessarily, not, might not necessarily be predictable in 1945. And the UN indeed has pioneered all sorts of programs and departments which were never mentioned in the original charter on peacekeeping, environmental protection, urban issues, election monitoring, counterterrorism, development, nuclear energy, nation building, all growing out of the central charge at the UN to maintain peace and security. Hence, the UN has been able to survive the Cold War, to survive an expansion from 51 states to 193, to survive that occasional refusal by a country to repay its UN dues, to survive its own weak, sometimes weak responses to crises, for example, in Syria today or Libya or Yemen. And finally, to survive the inevitable scapegoating that comes with taking on enormous world responsibilities. It has survived because in the end, countries have an ultimate faith that the organization will eventually find its way towards resolving problems and securing the peace. This does not mean, as I said, that the UN is a flawless body. It obviously still needs changes. After all, even the American Constitution has required amendments from time to time. But the instant, instant, institution's durability is nonetheless a tribute to the vision of a great American president, Franklin Roosevelt. And let us hope that that vision never dies. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, for that nice introduction. Thank you, Steve, for that historic perspective and your remarkable book, which is uh, required reading for anybody in this room. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here today. It is so good to see old friends and make new friends and see that UNA is thriving and so much good work is going on. Uh, as you know, Chris, I've supported and been part of UNA efforts for a long time, and I do believe all always have believed that the voice of the public is absolutely crucial to a successful United Nations. And that has to come from all parts of the country. And that's the reason I'm so glad that on Tuesday you will be visiting your representatives in the House and the Senate and will be choosing certain of the uh, issues to, to speak about to them and reminding them, I hope, that you care and you vote and you are a constituent of theirs. If they're doing the right thing, you can encourage them. If they're not, you can give them a prompt in the right direction. Um, I, uh, Steve and I informally agreed that he would talk about the past and I would talk about the future. An anniversary is a good time for that. And it is hard to believe that the United Nations is 70 years old, seven decades, my goodness. Um, and certainly much has pa happened over this time. Um, I think Steve would agree if I say that the charter is a brilliant document and in many ways far-sighted. But of course, time passes. And it is absolutely essential that any organization change and grow and adjust as time demands. Over these decades, the UN has indeed responded to need and opportunity in peacekeeping and development and democratization, disarmament, human rights, humanitarian relief, health, 
global pandemics, and so much more. But um, it has grown in ways that are not as useful and not as healthy. It has, as someone pointed out this morning, become a heavy bureaucracy and a very large one. It has not done what any good business would do, and that is have an annual review, or at least a biannual review, of what works and what doesn't, or what could be adjusted or combined or consolidated in some other effort, how to make the organization lean and effective. Um, I, um, I, I think that the United States has everything to gain by such a review because we are committed to a successful United Nations. Um, to the extent that the UN succeeds, we succeed as well. It allows the US to cooperate and to lead, to share the risk, the responsibility, the burden, and the benefits of joint action. But what does this change look like other than review? There are a couple of points on this that strike me very strongly. Steve mentioned that the 51 original states are now 193. And yet the Security Council is still dominated by the permanent five, the P5 as we always called it, the US, UK, France, Russia, and China, who have in the eyes of much of the world a disproportionate power. It may be a time to consider whether a fair opportunity might be given to, say, India or Brazil, or other very large active and contributing states, or that the states in the global south should have a larger voice or a larger presence. It may be time to ask a pledge that the P5 not use power of veto in the Security Council when it's a matter related to genocide or crimes against humanity. And it may be a time to reconsider the choice, that is the, the, the selection process for the Secretary General. And this is the point where I want to spend a couple of minutes. You probably are aware that historically, over 70 years, we've had eight Secretaries General, all men, I might add, and that those selections have always been made in a sort of um, secret uh, process. It's very hard to know quite what happens because it has come out of the Security Council, beginning coming out of discussions among the permanent five, and then has been presented as a fait accompli to the General Assembly for affirmation. Um, the General Assembly could, but never has, rejected or resisted this recommendation. In the last week of April, a friend of mine, Jean Krasno, and I wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Washington Post, suggesting that it is time for a woman Secretary General and that the search and selection process be opened up. Now, who can... <laughs> Who can object to transparency and accountability when that, in fact, is what we demand of the Secretary General? We proposed in this um, article that the search process be made much more open, that criteria be stated in terms of what is needed for the Secretary General, that the final candidates be presented, and of course with their backgrounds, and that more than one candidate be presented to the General Assembly. We also suggested, and I think you know what's coming, that a deliberate search be made to include women candidates among those, and we, um, not in the the article, but separately with a larger group that is forming, have built a list of some 20 or more women candidates from across the world who have just those qualifications. International experience, leadership at high levels, commitment to the fundamental goals of the UN, managerial experience, and proven communication skills, which I think are a, a critical point in this media age. We don't pretend that 
an effort like this will be decisive. We know that it probably will and surely will be decided through the Security Council. But we do think it's possible to open the process. And I, I want to let you know that there is already a group of member states, they call themselves the friends, of this discussion. And there has been in the General Assembly a full day's debate on just this question. If the General Assembly has some backbone on this, they can, I think, make it happen. Um, I'm, we have a meeting next week uh, at the U.S. mission, not with the ambassador, but with the number two person there, to discuss this. There is also a large new NGO, self-organized, called One for Seven Billion, which addresses just this question again, the search for the Secretary General, and some other issues as well. And um, we have a, a group of largely women who are particularly interested in having um, a woman candidate candidates, plural, considered and perhaps selected. To me, it is absolutely critical that we end up with the best possible Secretary General we can possibly find, wherever that person comes from, and that she or he bring to it the intellect and the passion and the ability to persuade that is really the hallmark of a successful Secretary General. I hope that UNA might consider this. And because you are the constituents, that when you speak with your own UN associations at home, and when you make your visits to the Senate, and in particular, if your senator serves on the Foreign Affairs Committee, you will raise this point. I would say once again, the best possible Secretary General we could find is in the interests of the US, and the UN and is critical to the future of the United Nations. This is the moment and time is of the essence. If we wait till next spring at this time, it'll be done. It'll be a done deal. So even though it may seem early, Ban Ki-moon's term ends at the end of 2016. So we're in a sense a year ahead of, of usual. I can tell you that this discussion, this movement, if I can call it that, is already happening. And I want to ask your help on this and your voice on this. I think it's time and I think it is possible. The last point I would make in looking to the future is just to flag for you a couple of very, very important uh, conferences. One is the conference coming up in December of this year in Paris on climate change. This is, of course, the culmination of our efforts over a number of years. Um, we are hoping that all countries will bring the best they can to address climate change. And I'm certainly hoping that the United States will stand up on this and that the president will speak out loud and clear. And I have heard you, you mentioned that the Pope is coming um, to the General Assembly in September. I've heard that he is going to speak to the climate change issue that is in, in support of these actions, uh, which will be very helpful indeed. The second is that next year, that is 2016, there will be a very, very important conference on humanitarian relief, humanitarian and refugee relief. You know we have 50 million refugees now, and we have to do better on that. So that will be uh, something to watch. They will be meeting in Istanbul in 2016. And finally, of course, is the work on the Sustainable Development Goals. The list is long, but it comes right to the heart of doing what we can to end poverty and to create a better world. I know you're informed on this and trust you will track it as well. So again, I thank you, UNA, friends and members, new members, younger members, older members. We are a I think a special team, we're connected by the cause that we share, and I wish you and us all success. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask one question of each of our panelists, and then we're going to turn it over to all of you. So gear up, get your questions ready, and start looking for our staff with mics here. 
But to start it off, uh, I began with that quote from the charter, the we the people side of the United Nations, which is so big for us as a grassroots or organization. But I think that was a pretty um, uh, avant-garde concept in the context of the negotiations itself, that there certainly were NGOs present. Our organization, it was called American Association for the United Nations at that time, uh, was there as one of the consultants, uh, that, that there were NGOs present. But you know, Steve, maybe you could, uh, could speak to us about looking back across that arc of 70 years, how surprised would the charter, um, charter delegates, the charter conference delegates have been to the role of NGOs, to the role of individual citizens in the mission and work of the United Nations? Just, is it, can you hear me? Yes. Just, okay. Uh, I, I would say that there's always been a tension at the UN between the states that are member nations of, of the uh, organization and the NGOs. But the UN, and I think this is another tribute to Roosevelt, in 1945 at the San, San Francisco conference, made a deliberate effort to allow NGOs to participate in that conference. I mean, that was quite extraordinary. That was not true in the League of Nations. The League of Nations did not particularly want to have NGOs circling around. But there was a very special kind of endeavor undertaken to bring out, I think, about 40 to 45 different NGOs to represent a lot of different viewpoints at the deliberations in that California city. Um, ever since then, uh, and in fact, there is a provision in the charter for NGOs to participate. I think ever since then, that tension though remains uh, because many states want to preserve what they regard as their own sovereignty and therefore their own ability as a government to project their own views. They don't really like to have uh, NGOs breathing down their necks. And, but, but in fact, it's now become institutionalized in the UN and, and they're very much a very incredible, a very important feature of the way the organization operates. Uh, so uh, yes, I think it was very deliberately done at the very at the, at the conference that set up the UN in 1945. It's expanded in the last 70 years. The tension will always remain there. It's probably a good tension. I mean, it does bring in viewpoints that otherwise wouldn't be heard. Uh, it doesn't always work. But God knows, if it wasn't around, we'd be hearing a lot less out of the UN, I think, in the, as, as regards to, uh, the decades we've already been through with the organization. Fantastic. And to you, Gillian, since you've worked for two secretary uh, generals and are such a passionate advocate for improving the process for selecting a secretary general, uh, that you have experience working for an ultimate insider secretary general, Kofi Annan, who came from the system, and then he was succeeded by Ban Ki-moon, who came from the outside. There are lots of different candidates that are being mentioned, some who come from the inside, who would be part of the system already, and some like Angela Merkel who would be ultimately an outsider, but with advantages there. Do you have a personal perspective on the advantages of an insider versus an outsider in elevating and advancing the role of the Secretary General? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say exclusively it should be one or the other. Of the eight Secretaries General, Kofi Annan was the only one that came from the inside. He was a UN, as I said this morning, he was a UN life and he was a UN career person. All the others were selected from governments or from foreign service uh, in countries around the world. Um, and, but all of them had some exposure and experience with the UN. They weren't totally uh, uh, foreign to it. Um, and you can learn, certainly, and you would build your staff and be supported by others who knew the UN extremely well. So I think the key is not just did you work in the UN uh, as a staffer, um, but do you understand it? Do you have the ability to work across borders? Do you have the uh, persuasive powers to engage the debate with others from different, different backgrounds and so on? And, um, and do you have a, an inside uh, knowledge of the current problems and crises that face the UN? It's a very demanding job. I would also have, do you have the sheer physical energy to do it? It's, it's, the million miles you travel, the constant pressure of one crisis after another, it is physically very, very demanding. Um, but I think those qualities are out there, uh, and, and we'll find them. And we should certainly 
set the high standard and hold to it. Fantastic. All right, the floor is open. <laughs> John in the back. There's sometimes been talk about at the level of the U.S. A constitutional convention to undo something like the Electoral College, which is sort of a vestige of the founding of our country. But using the, uh, the, uh, the case of the Security Council, which of course represents more 1945 reality than contemporary realities, what are the obstacles, what are the considerations? Is, is it realistic to think that there might be structural reform of the UN someday that would make it a more democratic institution? Steve, you want to speak to that? Well, that's, that's a very good question. That's the eternal question, frankly, about the UN. I mean, that's the one that constantly is debated even today in the organization. It was, it was a matter of great passion back in 1945 at the San Francisco conference when uh, the five sponsoring powers suddenly presented this document to the, all the other 45 states out there and said, five of us are gonna have, be permanent members of veto power. And the other states said, well, what about us? And they were used to the idea under the league that everybody would have the veto. And it was a, they had to, the five sponsoring powers literally had to quell a rebellion in, in San Francisco in order to get their charter through because there was still such anger against uh, these uh, countries, these five chosen countries for possessing that power. The reason why the smaller countries finally caved in is that both the Soviet Union and the United States basically said, if you don't give us this power, we're gonna walk out of this conference. And, you know, the smaller states said, well, you know, we'd rather have you two inside than outside. And so we're willing to, to, to live with it. But uh, in the end, they, they've never been satisfied since. And every time there's been a reform moon at the UN, the last one was in 2005, this issue has come to the forefront. Uh, whether it's gonna change, very difficult to know. Um, the problem is that, uh, there's a couple of problems. One is that, you know, the United States, for example, has paid lip service to have, including Germany and Japan, for example, as permanent members. Whether they get permanent members with the veto or without, it's not clear, but uh, there's always at least one or two countries uh, uh, among the permanent five will always veto any other suggestion from any of the other uh, permanent five. So that if the US tried to bring in Japan, China would veto that. Germany would probably be vetoed by uh, one of the European powers, Great Britain or France, because they prefer to be the European representatives on the UN. I, w I once, but even if you got to the point where there was some admissibility of some sort, maybe having Brazil come in for as a permanent power, but without the veto, which is one of the compromises that has been bandied about. Um, you would have, as, I remember having this conversation with Kofi Annan, he said, the problem with that is that you're gonna have objections from Argentina, from Venezuela, from Mexico saying, why should Brazil be the representative of Latin America? We wanna be the representative. So it, it, it's a, it creates tension on regional levels as well as on, on the global level. And it doesn't, I frankly don't see a clear situation which is gonna change things, at least for the next 10, 20 years, until there's such pressure that develops around the world through NGOs, through uh, you know, communities of, of people interested in the UN around the globe, through uh, uh, maybe governments themselves that would you know, kind of grab hold of the issue and make it a central point about the, whole, the functioning of the organization. Till that happens, I don't really see the possibility of change right now. Thank you. I think, I yes, please, please. Gillian, yes. That's absolutely true on the questions of peace and security, but it's not true on the matter of the selection of the Secretary General, because that is not in the chart. It's been a more or less a tradition, but it has shifted a bit over time. So the change on the selection process could happen without it having to come to a vote or, or a veto. It could be just a decision that they come to. Excellent point. I saw Marsha's hand first, so we're going to go to Marsha. Keep your hands up, though, so I can see others. And then we'll go to the corner of the room in the back after Marsha. Thank you, Marsha Brewster, UNA Westchester. Um, Gillian, on the, on the question of insider or outsider and talking about women leaders, I just thought I'd bring up the point that 
Um, there were at least three presidents, prime ministers, who served as undersecretary generals. Um, Michelle Bachelet, um, Grobar Brundtland, and Mary Robinson. So they have insider and outsider expertise. And then there were at least two American women who served as undersecretary generals who were US civil servants, Carol Bellamy at UNICEF and Catherine Bertini at um, World Food Program. So I mean, that's kind of, that's a possible model to t pick up somebody who's had both. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that it's really important to have more women in UN peacekeeping operations, especially the head of, you, uh, you know, the under, you know the Undersecretary General of DPKO. Gillian, I do agree um, on having more women in peacekeeping. Um, on the earlier point, um, just bear in mind that a, a Secretary General would never come from any of the permanent five countries. It has always been someone from a small or mid-sized country, and that is because the P5 already has this disproportionate power. So you have to think out across our borders. Look elsewhere. All right, in the back, National Capital Area chapter. Thank you, my name is Eric Thompson with the National Capital Area. Um, and I, my question is about civil society participation at the UN moving forward. Um, in my day job, I'm a policy advocate that goes to the UN several times a year to advocate, and the space for civil society participation radically decreasing in recent years. Um, the CSW outcomes document this year was pre-negotiated before most of the 9,000 activists arrived in New York. Um, despite the My World Standard surveys and everything for the SDGs, I heard Charlotte Bunch call that control by over-engagement. Um, what opportunities do you see to, at the very least, to protect the space for civil society participation moving forward, if not strengthen? Good one for both our panelists. Gillian, perhaps you start because NGO engagement used to be under your purview. Well, civil society engagement is here to stay. There are over 4,000 accredited uh, NGOs at the UN now, and most of them are doing very good work, and not just around headquarters. They're out in the field, and they're uh, active in other capitals around the world. But your question about the space touches on a practical matter, and that is the sheer numbers and the availability of meeting rooms. Since the renovation was going on, our available space uh, was very tight. Um, now, now they're back in headquarters, but still there's no room there that holds 9,000 people. If I remember correctly, the largest room holds, I believe, 1,500. So people who plan these enormous conferences have to know that in advance. If you need a space for 9,000 people, I don't know where you're going to go, but you need to check that ahead of time. Shea Stadium, maybe. Um, um, uh, be, because um, it's not right to bring people all the way to New York on the assumption that they'll be meeting inside the UN and then discover that they can't get in. That's not a good situation. Um, but we know the limits of space, we know the seating capacity, and that should be made clear to everyone who plans meetings there. Steve? Yeah, I just mentioned one thing that occurred to me, that this might be an issue that the NGO community can make as part of the whole issue of getting a new secretary general. Like pinning, pinning on any per person who's up there for the job, what are you going to do about the NGO community and how are you going to accommodate its participation in, in, the, in the organization in the future? It seems to me a very good issue that should be addressed at that particular moment when, they're, when these uh, contestants for this job are most open to listening to these kind of demands. That's actually a good time for a plug for something called the World Federation of United Nations Association, WFUNA. It brings together UNA USA and 99 other UNAs from 100 different nations. They're having their plenary in Vancouver this fall, and that's one of the very big issues that they're going to be addressing, all of us as, as United Nations associations from around the world. There's a representative of WFUNA here up in the, um, in the gallery where we have desks. Uh, so if you're interested in engaging on a global level on these issues, go talk to Julia from Wafuna. Next question. Ed? Thank you, uh, uh, I, I, one addition to Steve Schlesinger's observations about the history, uh, the AAUN, our predecessor organization, was very deeply involved in the dialogue, also with FDR, even before the San Francisco conference. Clark Eichelberger, 
Uh, Chris's predecessor a while back had seven meetings with FDR in the period from 1943 to 1945 in pushing him on the creation of the UN. And the, the NGO community played a major role at the San Francisco conference in getting a continuing role for NGOs into the UN Charter and in getting the provisions on human rights into the Charter. These are very important accomplishments for us in our organization. But we should look forward also in the spirit that Gillian says, and I would like to submit, picking up on the observations of both, that each one of our UNA chapters around the country should pick up this issue. We should have sessions where we educate ourselves and educate our colleagues about these issues and ultimately, we should be pushing our organization nationally in the sense of this agenda. Finally, picking up exactly on what Chris said, we should not only be pushing nationally, we should be going to Wafuna, we should be saying to Wafuna, you should have your national UNAs around the world taking positions with their governments publicly on the kinds of things that Gillian and Steve have been talking about. Thank you. Thank you for that. And on the history mention, the, up, up on that mezzanine level on the right is a booth that, with documents, examples of UNA USA's history in the, in the Charter Conference, but also the conference itself. Don't, don't forget to stop by. It's going to be gone at the end of today. Uh, next question, observation. Let's see. Uh, in the blue uh, uh, jacket over there. Hi, I'm uh, Pimon Naomi okay. from Pacific LA chapter. Um, on the NGO topic, um, I would like to say that there are NGOs that they have uh, consultative status with United Nations and ECOSOC status. Um, however, I don't see that much involvement with United Nations except uh, probably having some side events uh, happening at the events and General Assembly. Uh, one good thing though at the Human Rights Council, uh, these NGOs get to actually read a verbal statement at these sessions and they can actually influence uh, a lot when these topics are discussed between the uh, 42, 47 members of the Human Rights Council. Uh, one thing though is that the Council of Organizations from the UNA I think can be a good model in getting uh, NGOs and outside organizations more involved and I think there is a big room for that to grow when uh, we are here at the UNA uh, trying to get these uh, NGOs more involved and, and make a good model uh, as well. I, I really want to say uh, thank you for getting some of these outside organizations uh, at this conference to exhibit and to be participating. Thank you. Gillian, perhaps you could speak to uh, the impact of NGO advocacy since that's at the core of the question. I think in NGO advocacy is absolutely critical. I think I might reference that in my remarks. There has to be a voice from the public. Uh, and that's what, it, that's what encourages and inspires our political leaders. If they know that you care, you know you care and you vote. So I support that totally. I also am in favor of partnerships. I noted that Chris's earlier reference to the event in Dallas with the United States Institute of Peace. That's an ideal partner. So is Rotary, so are some others who are involved in peace efforts in one way or another, um, and partnerships can be a good way to plan to, to join right. forces. I, I think we had Milwaukee in the back, uh, and then we'll, we'll move forward to Aaron after that. Letters from the Milwaukee chapter. Um, excellent presentation. Um, uh, Stephen Seisten drew an excellent point about the importance of the NGOs at the very founding of the United Nations and continued since. Gillian's made a wonderful proposal for what to do next. Sometimes back in the Milwaukee chapter, people complain, oh, we talk about things, but we don't follow up on them properly. Is it worth maybe following up on these presentations? Um, is it possible to have a strong NGO voice on Gillian Sorensen's proposal? Is it possible maybe even to pass a resolution while we're all here together? Wouldn't that be a strong, singular voice for the UNA in favor of a really, it seems to be a sensible proposal? Um, I don't know if this is the proper place for that. Maybe it's outlandish to do that if you haven't done it before. But at the very least, as a fallback, perhaps to uh, pass a resolution that all the chapters consider this proposal and consider lobbying about it. Thanks. 
I, I would say to speak to that, our individual chapters pass resolutions all the time, so this is a great platform to think about what you do at an individual chapter level. We do our national policy through a national survey process where we get input from all those different chapters. Uh, so this is also a time to think about how you influence that national uh, process going forward. Uh, but Aaron, I think you're the next in, in line. Amy. I'd like to, of course, welcome Gillian. She is a member of our Council of Organizations Executive Committee. So she's one of us and, and uh, very, very welcome. Uh, the point about NGO involvement, I think, is critical. And uh, as I mentioned in another session earlier today, uh, we as UA USA had more than 30 people attending a conference that was held this past August in New York by NGOs on the post-2015 Sustainable Development Agenda our agenda, our action agenda. That's exactly, I think, the points that are being made here today. We as NGOs can take a position, we can adopt more than a resolution, because the outcome from that conference was the outcome document from that conference became part of the Secretary General's uh, uh, collection of documents and collection of statements in formulating the SDGs. So that, that is action that we have been taking, uh, we will continue to take. The Council of Organizations, which is our body of NGOs under our umbrella, adopted the UN at 70 series, and we've been running a number of conferences under that banner. Uh, today, at our Council of Organizations meeting at 2 p.m., which I hope all of us who can will attend, we will start toward the UN at 75, a program looking as to what should be the agenda for the UN going forward. The election of a Secretary General is obviously going to be part of that agenda. A number of the issues that Steve mentioned in peace and security and, and how the balance should be handled will be part of that agenda. So we definitely, as UNA USA, as the Council of Organizations, will look to taking meaningful action, which can be done at our chapter level, can be done at a national level, and at an international level. So yes, we will have a voice if we express ourselves, if we come, if we take action, if we're part of the activities here at UNA USA. So I, I strongly invite all of us who can to come to that meeting. And I guess my question to both our panelists is, what would you like us to put on our agenda? I'll leave that to our two. Steve? Well, I, I think obviously the, the first question, which always comes up inevitably, is, is the balance of power in the, sec in the, in the Security Council. Um, again, you can never have enough voices on that issue because it's only by the kind of accumulation of protests over the years that something will eventually change in the Security Council. And so to have that a central focus of, of NGO interests and protests is important. It reminds the uh, delegations from these the five permanent powers that this issue is not going to go away. Something has to be done about it. And uh, you may recall there was one change in the Security Council back in what, 1963. It expanded from 11 members to 15. So, it, you know, there are changes that can be made. And uh, I, I've talked to a number of delegates, particularly the one from Brazil, who are, you know, very much in the, on the lobbying front on, 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 on either expanding the, the, uh, the council or, in addition, bringing in permanent members without the veto. I mean, that, that is, seems to be a, a compromise that, that has been uh, suggested. Um, I, I thought that to me would be the, the central issue because it's the one that's, that sticks in the, in the throats of so many different nations and has, has for the last 70 years. Okay. And you, Gillian, what's the one on the agenda? I, wouldn't, I, I, I agree with what Stephen said, but I think I'm going to stick to my main point, and that is this issue of the selection of the next sec Secretary General, because I believe that is doable if we have enough voices and enough governments pressing that direction. The amendments to the Charter are much more complicated. Perhaps it can be done, but it won't happen fast. This other, we have a year year and a couple of months to make it happen, and, and, and that's what I hope to see. Excellent. I believe we have a question right here in front. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ariel Tavares, and I'm here with the Seton Hall Campus Chapter and the United Nations Association of the Dominican Republic. I have two questions addressed to each one of you, and they are 
Do you believe the Secretary General's selection process could and should be included as part of the Security Council working event in Tampa as it needs to address the need for transparency? And my second question is, what role do you see the UN change management team playing in the post-2015 era concerning the need for UN institutional accountability? Well done, Gillian. Um, I don't know the particular, uh, what did you call it in your first question? Change management. The working the Security Council working methods handbook? Okay, the Security Council working methods handbook. Okay, I've not seen that. Um, but, but I am certainly for transparency. Isn't that what we ask of our leaders, of our governments, of our businesses? Putting sunshine on these issues is the healthiest, best thing we can do. Now, there may be limits, you may not say every discussion needs to be out in the open, but some good measure of it should be. So um, whether it's part of a handbook or not, I don't know, but I think the issue could stand on its own. And the change management team is taking a much larger look at, at the whole United Nations. Um, change has to come from the top. And it's very difficult because, because the SG is so busy, so totally occupied. Um, and he's given directions for it to happen, but he's got to be able to see to, to, to track it and to hold people accountable for that change. Um, from the inside, I do believe there is what we used to call redundancy, meaning duplication. It could definitely be leaner. Um, but not altogether. It is not really overstaffed. It's a matter of are you well staffed, rightly staffed for the particular needs. Um, so it's a huge managerial question, um, and uh, the change management team has to keep at it. A new secretary general, though, should be questioned about that in advance, and obviously we hope that that we hope that she would commit to that. I would say the, the, the detail of that question betrays the fact that you come from Seton Hall, which is the one school of diplomacy in the nation that has made its primary focus uh, the United Nations, and we are, we are honored to be their partner nationally. Uh, I'm speaking to Seton Hall as we... Exactly. In the very back, and then I see Rita's hand as well, in, with the green scarf. Anne, I believe. <laughs> Annette Robertson, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, at the end, this is for Gilead, and Stephen, I've read your book. I, I don't know if you brought copies, but it's a great book. I think people here should have the opportunity to, to, to see it here and read it. Uh, Gilead, a question for you. At the end of April, 900 of us around the world um, met at The Hague at the International Criminal Court to honor the foremothers, one of which my grandmother was, in the inception of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, it was very, very exciting. and. They, uh, of course, Eleanor Roosevelt was there, Jane Addams, originally in 1915. But 1,300 women made it to The Hague at that time, 1915, and they had dirt roads, and was tra travel was very tough. Uh, the point is, is that how can we, the, those of us who are involved with the uh, Women's International League, support this idea for the Secretary General, because they are so strong internationally. And we have uh, drafted the Congress of the WILPF has drafted a new manifesto, and they're, you know, they're finding ways to come to the table. They have the same issues. They're interested. We're parallel with the UN, and the WIL has always been involved with the UN. And Eleanor Roosevelt was from the inception. So I, there's a great system right there at NGO that can help make this happen. And I think the timing is perfect. So please let us know how we can uh, push this. Excellent. We would very much welcome your support and your voice. I know of the Women's International League, and that would be a tremendous added uh, uh, part in moving this way. Rita? Uh, I'm Rita Marin from the East Bay chapter, and addressing the question of the next Secretary General, um, I thought we have already a perfect candidate and um, Navi Pile, who is the former, just passed, High Commissioner for Human Rights, has been approached on this, but she says she's from the wrong continent. Now, how about the division, the geographic division of apportionment of positions uh, by the UN in, in taking on new uh, replacement personnel? And secondly, um, it was a question put to 
Barack Obama, before he was president, put to him, I believe by UNA, if I recall, a series of questionnaires that the UNA sent out to major candidates. And among the questions was, do you believe in UN reform? And he said, of course I do, as long as we don't change the, the Security Council. So we have obstacles. The imagination that's going to be needed to get around these questions is enormous. And I look at the example of responsibility to protect. This R2P, responsibility to protect, is a notion put forward by the United Nations itself quite a number of years ago, saying the charter binds us to respect for state sovereignty. How, what can we do when the state itself does not live up to its obligations uh, in respect of the well-being of its citizens? Do we then say that that state no longer is entitled to the protections of the charter? I'm not saying that's a way forward, although there are many Australians and others arguing that. I'm saying that the notion of a new piece of, of creation of law around the existing charter, which we must respect, and not to breach the charter, but to use it and to come at it from another angle. And the women's possible, possible woman um, secretary general would certainly be an opening that way. Steve, since it's a history question, I, I know that the charter itself doesn't speak to geographic rotation of secretary generals, but perhaps you could speak to how, the, how this has, has transpired and, and some, of, some of Rita's comments here. No, the uh, issue of geographic distribution or, or rotation anyway, um, sort of grew up out of the traditions of, of the UN, but as, as uh, Chris noted, it's not in the charter. Um, problem is that it's one of these rhythms of life at the UN that has become kind of institutionalized in a way that it's sort of hard to break. As, as many of you probably know, the, 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 the latest rotation will be to Eastern Europe uh, because that it's the one area that has been left out over the last 70 years. And there are actually a number of female candidates from Eastern Europe that have, their names have been put forward. Um, so we may be in a situation where, in fact, geographical distribution does lead to a selection of a woman candidate, a woman secretary general. Nonetheless, I, I go back to the notion that I think the secretary general should be chosen on merit, and geographical distribution should not really be the basis of the way selection is made. Um, and uh, the problem is that because regions have ha had this in the past, it's very difficult to see if you can get support for breaking away from that routine. And I, I, again, it's one of these issues that where pressure can, take, can, can have some impact on the way delegates are thinking about this issue. But right now, there's no pressure on geographical distribution. And in fact, the only pressure which is good pressure coming right now is for uh, the, the notion that it has to be a woman as the next Secretary General. You can see it from what Gillian's op-ed piece, uh, the, there's been a number of organizations that have come out emphatically about a, a woman uh, Secretary General. This is an issue that's not gonna go away and it's gonna be very much part of the dealings and deliberations at the UN over the next year. I think we have time for one last question. Herb? Hello. I'm Herb Beristock from the East Bay Chapter. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we've raised already the question of structured reform in the UN in several ways in the opposition of the P5 and the problems that the SG is so busy and everything else. In the Charter, there's the clause that calls for this review of the Charter in 10 years that the member states commit themselves to. And uh, some of us have heard it's kind of a dead issue because even though the GA can support it ultimately as a process question, the, the Security Council, the P5 can kill it. But is, does that have any weight at all? Does it mean anything all, at all? Or is that just uh, now an outdated re uh, relic uh, of, the, uh, of the Charter? And if it could be enacted, uh, or if there's a maneuverable way to get it into uh, operation, how could that be done? It's a little like the military commission. It's sort of, it's, it's in the charter, but it's never really been uh, uh, operational in any real sense. 
Uh, it was done because some of the founding fathers and mothers of the UN thought, you know, that like the U.S. Constitution, we should be able to reopen the question of, of, of how a charter is put together. Uh, and, and part of the resistance to having a new um, convening conference on the charter is, of course, will it be a runaway conference, which will um, eviscerate a lot of the best qualities of the UN. Uh, but in any case, it doesn't, in my view, I never hear people talk about it at the UN. I've never really heard any serious discussion about going in that direction. The feeling is that you try to work within the confines of the Charter as it, as it is today. And um, therefore, no, I, I, I frankly think it's un, 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 you leave, uh, let me put it away. It's just, in my view, not going to happen as I see in the next 10, 20 years. I don't know about what Gillian says about it. I agree with you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, join me in thanking our panel. And, and then I have a couple of announcements and Shante will guide us through our breakout sessions. But first of all, since we've had this fantastic discussion about the selection of the Secretary General, about UN reform, the platform in which we engage in that debate the most as UNA USA is through the World Federation of United Nations Associations. And there are two people I wanna have stand up. Would Joe Baxter in the back there stand up? And Tita Banks, if you would stand up. They have been wonderful people. <laughs> Joe Baxter from our, our president of our Connecticut chapter, uh, Tita, president of UNA Houston. They have been selected by the steering committee to chair our delegation as UNA USA that will go to Wafuna. They will, we will have other people on that delegation, but they will be casting our vote as UNA USA on these very issues. So if you are passionate about this, they're the people to connect with. And also if you're passionate enough that your chapter budget can swing to send somebody to Vancouver, um, I, I would encourage you to do so. But the other thing though, because some of you we're only gonna see today, most of you I hope we will see on Tuesday when we actually make a case for strong US leadership in the UN. But some of you, you gotta go off to a job as a intern um, in Washington DC on Monday. We're not gonna see you again. The one thing we can do is we can advocate right now. It, how many of you have a cell phone that is already registered into the guest network here at, at NEA? All right, a few. The rest of you, if you have a chance over the course of the breakout sessions, I'd love you to grab that passcode over there. And what I want you to do is once you get onto the network, because we can't get cell phone co coverage downstairs here, I want you to text 313131. That's 313131. That's gonna send a letter to your member of Congress expressing your support for our US leadership in the UN, for our full funding of the UN budget. But it all starts with that. Uh, we're gonna be there on Tuesday, but, I want, but for those of you who are gonna be with us, let's get that letter in, in the hands of our congressional delegation before you come. And for those who we won't see again, let's do it now.